and we'll be sending the recording out after. All right. So you can see today we're going to be chatting to you about the introduction to Industry 4.0 and IIoT. Um, we're going to be speaking about the key components and then we're going to provide you some case studies for smart manufacturing. And then we're also going to be talking to you about imagining Industry 5.0 and then finally to wrap it up a summary. So today uh, we'll introduce you to your presenters. We have the Deputy Dean of the Engineering Institute of Technology, Indu, online. She has over 17 years of experience in engineering leadership and engineering education and is currently a PhD student. We've got AK, who is actually based over in Melbourne, Victoria, um, and he is one of the Engineering Institute of Technology's course coordinator and lecturer, and he is a specialist within the electrical and mechatronics fields. So, two very passionate engineers talking to you today. Just a quick overview on what the Institute of Technology is before we get started with the tech topic. Um, for everyone online today, we're one of the only institutes in the world that specialises in engineering. It makes us very unique. Um, last year, we actually delivered courses to over 2,000 students around the globe. Um, got an alumni of students from over 140 countries. Um, we've even had a student who studied from Antarctica um, because he had to go over there for work. We've got a massive range of programs ranging from professional certificate courses all the way through to a Doctor of Engineering. Um, we've got a massive network of industry-based expert lecturers around the globe. Um, we recently ran a webinar um, with five of our um, expert lecturers based around the globe, so they obviously teach our students. Um, and then finally, we utilise a unique methodology that makes use of remote and virtual laboratories um, throughout your study. So, um, it's very, very exciting. I will now hand over to Indu and AK. Thanks. Thanks, Caroline. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's session, and um, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Now, before we jump in to see you know, what Industry 4.0 is and where to next in terms of Industry 5.0, uh, you know, it's beneficial, I think, to understand the evolution of manufacturing since the 1800s. So let's start with that. <clears throat> now, industry 1.0, as you can see, um, you know, it consists of a massive increase in agricultural production, and that was actually supported by both the expansion um, uh, of um, the steam engine, so the invention of steam engine in 1784s um, helped into the leading to the adoption of manufacturing processes. It also helped us to um, expand and um, also support the large population we started seeing um, during those stages. Now, it was still very highly labor intensive, I would say, and, you know, boring work conditions. You know, you can remember if you're seeing the you know, old movies, you have smoky factories, um, prominent industrial cities. You know, that was Industry 1.0. And then we migrated into Industry 2.0, where, you know, the path was paved to mass production. And that was, uh, again, enabled by both division of labor as well as the electricity revolution. So it, we can say it was a bit of a technological revolution. So we had the invention of conveyor belts in the 1870s and in the early 1914s there was a use of um, electric power, telegraphs, automobiles and this gave rise to you know assembly lines and sequential production. Um, so that was industry 2.0. Then we moved further into 3.0. Now again if you notice these two decades to you know um, go on to Industry 3.0 effect is what my generation is familiar with. So we started having the use of information technology and electronics, both from a manufacturing side as well as in our social lives. So you could say it was digital um, revolution. Um, so 1960s, you could call, was the information era. We had PLCs, we saw internet. We also saw a rise in scalability of 
automation during this time and we were able to control um, things like you know we could repeat processes and we could be um, working on you know reliability in production which enabled us to have lower cost as well and then the past few decades where we jump into the industry um, 4.0 next we that's what we've been living through most of you guys here attending will be living through the past um, you know industry 4.0 which has taken basically the emphasis of digital technologies to a whole new level. And this we are able to achieve, you know, with um, what we call as Internet of Things, uh, you know, the interconnectivity through your IoT. We got real time data via sensors and got the introduction of what we call as cyber physical systems. You can say that with your industry 4.0 that we actually have now started having a more um, a holistic view, a more comprehensive interlinked manufacturing system, which is able to connect both the physical world to the digital world. And in turn, we have started seeing, you know, better collaboration, better access. I mean, we are talking from different, um, you know, parts of the world now, again, due to IoT, we've got better access to information control. And that has also helped us in productivity and it has driven growth. But while we are living in the industry 4.0 it's only natural for us as humans to start imagining and thinking about the next stage so as per progression we can call it the industry 5.0 now like i said the fifth industrial uh, evolution i would say not a revolution is yet to materialize and is currently what we are going through is an exercise in predicting what is about to come you know and this is based on our you know current technologies and expect future technologies and trends as well so we imagine, for example, the industry 5.0 to be able to help us solve challenges that's facing humanity. So things like environmental con concerns, increasing inequality, race management, and also the new dynamics of workforce. How do we expect, how do we expect our work to change? Now, although one could actually argue that there are a few, um, not many, but a few bleeding edge organizations who are already leading this particular transition. And we'll look at some of them in the next couple of slides. Now, this is just giving us a big picture of what Industry 4.0 is and trends in it. So Industry 4.0, um, or you can call it IIoT or IoT or Smart Manufacturing, these are all actually used to describe the same thing. It's about how your physical systems and operations are connected with your digital technology and which basically enhanced with you know you've got your big data basically all your sensors collecting data and how we analyze the data using for example machine learning or ai technologies to create a whole more holistic manufacturing um, um, ecosystem now the key driver for companies though um, and plants is for embracing this 4.0 is that they all need the real-time insights across their platforms because that gives them a your edge in the in the competitive market so they want insights across their platforms their products their processes people and partners so this is about um, you know changing the way we think changing how we operate and how we grow as an entire organization a business as well as as an entire society now going into thinking about what is IIoT a little bit more in detail <clears throat> as we described earlier IIoT or Industrial um, Internet of Things is basically using you have, you know, if you can um, see in this picture, you've got your um, network connected sensors and you have other monitoring devices and tools basically improve in looking at the context of manufacturing, improve the manufacturing quality in the products or the parts that you're developing. So, like I said, it's a network of intelligent devices, um, again, connected by your um, data communication structure that you have for that particular network, which in turn you monitor, you collect data, you exchange data, you analyze data. And so you've got your data analytics, you've got your connectivity, you've got your apps. All this is there to improve um, improvement in your operations. How do we attain this improvement? So you use things like your sensors, your actuators, you've got your tools like apps. So we can use them to, for example, auto supervise processes, or you can analyze data in useful formats, for example. We can also deliver new features to products quicker and better 
than ever before because of smarter monitoring systems we can have in place. We can have predictive um, maintenance based on condition monitoring again, and thus reducing, obviously, uh, if you can do predictive maintenance, you reduce downtimes, and hence you increase product lifetime value in general. Now, things that used to be manual and used to take us a lot of time to analyze, to calculate, can now easily be automated. That means there's more free time for us you know, to think about more higher level tasks, to think about more about strategy. So we get better heightened holistic visibility and you can use, for example, algorithms, you can use dashboards, you can use um, notifications via apps and you know, make your process much more streamlined, much more efficient. So IIoT leverages the power of smart machines and real-time analytics, and we take advantage of this data, so we so-called call uh, dumb machines and sensors collect for us, to better um, use our time in place. Now, one of the things that people get concerned about is the higher automation that we talk about. Now, while we talk about higher degrees of automation, we need to note that this is not about taking the human out of the equation and installing just machines in the processes. But it's more about utilizing the power of the human creativity and capability to drive efficiencies. So it should be thought about in form of strategy and the value creation that we achieve in the process, rather than thinking that you know machines are going to take over our jobs um, in that kind of sense. Next, as we think about um, industrial IoT applications, now this is just a simplistic, simplistic view of IoT and its capability. I would, I always think that you know, the human creativity and ideas provide us with infinite possibilities for any applications, and you know, including IoT applications. So here we have some examples of the IoT in terms of a smart industry perspective. Again, this picture does not represent a smart manufacturing perspective, but more about a smart industry perspective. If you think about smart manufacturing, things that I talked about just previously, things like product monitoring or condition-based um, predictive maintenance, you can think about supply chain, logistic management, you can think about asset monitoring, process optimization using engineering simulations or digital twin technology. You can also think about operator productivity via connected tools so that, you know, for example, things that you have to do repetitively can be eliminated. The human error part can be eliminated and you can be thinking about data productivity in a different level. You also can think uh, in the manufacturing perspective, quality control. You have vision systems that can deliver products over time and time again. So quality control is there. And you also have things like variables that can also ensure your work safety as well. Now, in terms of um, the general idea of it, we have to think about IIE as a solution. It's not a product that you're delivering, but it's a solution that you have to think about holistically. And again, it's not a standard product. You can't just take one product and say, you know, I've implemented IIoT or Industry 4.0 in my um, manufacturing. It's more about customizing you've got using appropriate technologies and appropriate algorithms that suit your particular needs. So any manufacturing unit or plant should consider this as a solution to the existing problems and think about as a unique position of how to create value and how to solve particular challenges that you've got. And let's talk about the key components of IIoT. So similar to hundreds of applications in IIoT, there are hundreds of fonts and terms associated with it as well. Now, you would hear a lot of technical jargons when you think about IIoT, and you might get a little bit confused, but some of the things you would hear are things like data, you would think you'd hear things like AI, you might think about M2M, smart factories, machine learning, um, additive manufacturing, you've got neural networks, cyber physical systems, digital twins, and the list goes on. Some of the main things um, that we probably need to think about in terms of the key components, um, I would classify them in a broad category. Um, you can think about them firstly as people and society. So at the center of the implementation, again, it should always be people and society. I mean, why are we investing in something if it's not going to benefit people or the society as a whole? When I talk about society, I'm talking about the holistic environment and the society, not just human beings, um, just to take as a point. 
So people in the IIoT environment, obviously, uh, will have access to more operational data, um, you know, because of all the sensors that are collecting data. So they have more ways of interacting with this data, with the machinery, with the environment, uh, with mobile devices, variables, whatever it might be. And you can imagine how, for example, you can empower someone to make better decisions, work more efficiently and safely. Imagine a remote mines worker who would have been in a very dangerous situation previously, but now because of remote mines operation capabilities has you know, more than 95% safer work condition. So it's again providing something useful back to the people or the society in the end. Then you can think about the next category as intelligent assets. <clears throat> so for an effective IIoT, you need to think about everything within the production area. Everything must be connected and must be capable of communication. So communication in terms of either both sending and receiving data, and that should be obviously to a central controller. So this means you have to think about installing um, smart equipment, which are which has built in IIoT functionality. And again, you choose, should be using external and you know internal uh, monitors, controllers, and other devices to talk to. Then you think about the next category as your data infrastructure. So this could mean, for example, having thousands or even depending on the scale of your manufacturing plant, millions of connected devices. Again, each sending and receiving data. There's also things about when you're talking about data infrastructure, things about things like cybersecurity has to be taken into account as well. Um, and things like your, you know, what type of infrastructure that you're using for your data capabilities. Is it Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, is it LTE to transmit and receive data? And again, all this supported by your backend services like, you know, a robust cloud service. And last but not least, everything else, you know, what is the point of collecting all this data if not about data analytics? So one of the greater goals of your, you know, Industry 4.0, so to speak, is a greater level of automation. And again, when you talk about automation, it's not about, you know, uh, preventing someone to do their job, but it's about getting a higher level of efficiency. It means having sophisticated systems that again can process all the data that we collect from these sensors in real time so that we can manage outputs quickly, we can manage efficiencies, and we are able to attend to issues as they arise. So AI, again, will play an increasing role in such systems. Um, and you've got industry data, again, offering great insights into this kind of thing and that drives, again, for us to think about a higher level strategy. What I'll do now is I'll pass over to my colleague, Dr. AK, who will drive further into um, the IIoT using case studies. Over to you, AK. Thank you so much, Indu. So I would just like to uh, thank Indu for the wonderful presentation so far about introducing IIoT. So in the next stage, what I'll be discussing about is Industry 4.0 case studies for smart manufacturing. Now, as Indu mentioned, for IIoT, it's all about the different components it has and the benefits it provides, which in this case would be allowing the worker or yeah to work from a remote location and to uh, you know monitor the operations monitor the different components and how the idea is in a smart manufacturing that can be beneficial as well ultimately iiot industry 4.0 smart manufacturing these are all part of the same system because iiot was originally developed to be to help to be helpful with the, the smart manufacturing concept so if you have a look at a basic manufacturing process and different stages of production, development, distribution, the, what IIoT basically helps you with is different sensors, smart sensors that allows you to remotely monitor the different operation, provide you with analytical help with the cloud support, and all these different aspects that helps humans to be in a safer location and at the same time, overview the operation and get a higher level view and a control uh, over the operation. So if you have a look at a smart manufacturing context, so IIoT would uh, help you at the bottom level with sensors. So you'll have different sensors that are basically embedded in different machines. And that allows you to not only check the, uh, or, or the condition so you'll be able to monitor the condition of the operation, but at the same time, you'll be able to check the health status of the machines and how they're working well and 
um, as you'll see later on, the concept of uh, predictive maintenance. So that will basically help you with identifying whether a machine will might fail in future so that uh, you can do some maintenance in advance. Similarly, with the technologies uh, that you have now, machines are able to talk with each other. So in an assembly line, if you have different uh, machines that are connected to each other using the IoT technology, you'll be able to communicate, or rather the machines will be able to communicate with them, and you will see how they will be doing the operation. Then you'll have the context of cognition. I think someone was asking a question about that. So because you'll have the technology allowed now, what that will basically do is you'll be able to connect everything using the cloud and you know, all the information from the machines will be provided back to the uh, cloud from which uh, from a remote location you will be able to monitor as well as have a higher level of control over the operation. So you will be able to make decisions related to that from a higher level and using the cloud technology. Whereas uh, previously you would have, would have to have like, uh, you know, some on ground level as well. But here with the sensors, you are getting a lot of uh, information beforehand. And also with the cloud, it's helping you with analytical support that helping the decision making a lot smoother as well. And hence, it helps with the supervisory control. So what is the benefits of IIoT? So in uh, smart manufacturing, the first one would be scalability. So as I mentioned, with the industrial IoT, it employs a network of sensors to collect critical information all uh, throughout the industrial operation and helps and with the use of cloud software, you are able to analyze those data and provide them in a way that can be beneficial. Now, what that eventually does, it, it basically helps uh, with automation manufacturers, basically. They have a newfound ability transfer staff to different departments as a result uh, the dangerous areas of productions that don't are not necessarily uh, need to be manned by humans uh, being present there so you can actually operate them from a different location the other option is security so with this security what happens is because of the invent of iot the whole idea is that machines are communicating with each other there is always that risk of information not being know you know disrupted or hacked and as a result that data in present day becomes very important so with the technologies like machine learning and artificial intelligence that you have now you're able to detect errors a lot better and as a result that also becomes a part of manufacturing process then there comes the all critical component of control and visibility so one of the foremost concerns about Industry 4.0 was the possibility of mishaps due to glitches in cognitive comp computing. So that's why the process is hopefully with the process being more digitized, it helps you with a better control and visibility. Because as I mentioned in the previous slide as well, you're able to monitor all the data. And that is the main purpose or the main benefit of Industry 4.0. Because you're able to monitor that and mine those data in a proper way, it's giving you better understanding of operation at a higher level. And at the same time, you are able to control them much better. Other two are customer satisfaction and customization. Now, with the customer satisfaction, the main idea is that the only channel capabilities of is IoT cyber physical systems, it actually allows the com uh, companies rather to communicate with the customers during different stages of the operation. And as a result, the fulfillment of orders from that stage to order of the finished product, you have a better interaction with the um, customer and that's why it helps with the customer satisfaction. As for the customization with IIoT, you can of course have more customization than previously, known as mass customization. So you are allowed to, you know, get that benefit from IIoT. However, you, as you later see that there is more to, um, or there is another room for improvement in this area. And that is something we'll be discussing when we discuss about Industry 5.0. So going to the main topic that Ind was telling, me, telling you about, the case studies are Industry 4.0 in uh, smart manufacturing, or rather how IIoT is used in 
different uh, manufacturing operations. So it's not surprising to assume that because Industry 4.0 has been there for almost 10 years now. Different companies, big pioneers in this uh, manufacturing industry are already uh, or already has started using these uh, facilities. So, for example, ABB, one of the leaders in robotics and power in the uh, heavy electrical components, uh, equipments rather, and power industry and automation solution providers. So, ABB is uh, actually have I mean, managed to use a lot of predictive maintenance in their operation. So again, the idea is you'll have these robots that uh, they're really, uh, manufacturing, but they will have sensors embedded in them. And as a result, you'll be able to monitor the health of those robots. And uh, that will actually help with uh, predictive maintenance. So whenever there is any prediction of a failure happening in advance, you are able to in, yeah, do maintenance. This is, of course, uh, much better from the traditional uh, in the process where there was uh, not a lot of room for predictive operation, rather once uh, it was more about a reactive maintenance. Airbus, again, as you can see, one of the largest uh, like multinational uh, aerospace uh, corporation. They also have like digital manufacturing initiative. So a lot of the companies in the last five years uh, launched this digital in uh, manufacturing initiative. And the idea was, again, to streamline operation and bolster capacity. Again, they would use different sensors to their tools and machines. And uh, at the same time, they would also add a wearable technology. So with wearable technologies, you're also able to monitor the workers' uh, performance as well and how yeah, we can you know, monitor them and uh, help with the optimization of the process a lot better. A wearable technology, again, will become a lot more advanced as we grow over time, and that's something we'll be discussing in industry. No. Fanuc, a robot, um, a Japanese robot company, basically manufacturers. So they are also using sensors, similar to what you were mentioning for ABB as well. But they're also using the cloud-based analytics. So again, the idea is they're trying to predict when failure of components might happen, and that helps with the process equipment. So again, a large company, they are trying to understand why uh, or how, how to utilize IoT to further improve the manufacturing process. KUKA, again, a German robotics specialist. And uh, what they did was basically, again, they have certain uh, are implementing the IoT strategy that implements to their whole factories. So for example, um, they actually build an IoT enable factory with hundreds of robots that are actually built or rather linked to a private cloud. And the whole idea was that as these robots were connected to the clouds, they would be able to trans um, transfer information in a lot more optimized way. And as you can see from the results, it was much better than previous uh, performance. And they could see, as you can see, like they could produce up to 800 vehicles each day. Rio Tinto, so that's something close to home because uh, I'm in Australia now. But uh, as you can see, Rio Tinto is uh, uh, basically a British Australian mining corporation and they launched an innovative automated mining initiative. So, mining industry is also somewhere where the industry 4.0 operations can be quite beneficial. With the context uh, with the operations uh, of uh, autonomous drill technology so what they would do is they would have you know driverless trucks trains or ships basically that would be able to go to mining sites and uh, use like autom autonomous drill technologies but because it's a hazardous risky area with the context of uh, or with the uh, facilities of industry 4.0 again you could have workers working from a remote location and able to monitor the operation and again have better safety. So uh, basically, they have a control center complex in Perth, Australia, where we have engineers, analysts, and programmers remotely guiding this mining operation. Finishing off with Shell, no uh, presentation on manufacturing should be finished without the oil company being mentioned. So. Uh, named the most innovative oil and gas company, Shell. Uh, they actually have also recently uh, launched a digital twin initiative. So digital twin is again a quite 
are new technology but already being implemented when you actually have the idea of uh, whatever operation is running on the hardware you can actually prepare a virtualized version of the same operation and run it in real time in parallel with the hardware but the benefit with the digital twin is you can make software modifications on these technologies and see how let's say tweaking a certain parameter would result in the operation in real time and that you can then do in the hardware implementation so again uh, that's something that will probably be a, a lot more used in future. And uh, Shell is already using their high-tech wells, you know, where you have to get the oil, with fiber optic cable that allows employees to monitor operations remotely from a uh, safe distance. So you can see the pattern here with Industry 4.0. The idea is you are collecting information from a remote location and using sensors and cloud technology among other things to get a better understanding of what operation how the operation is running and what modifications can be done so it's not really about removing human as in the said but it's also uh, more about keeping human at a safe distance to help with the operation in an optimal manner so with IoT in smart manufacturing already increasing, uh, as you can see, some data that you can see from here, uh, from 2019, there is already a lot of investment, almost close to 200 billion in 2019 on IoT being used in manufacturing. And most of it, as you can see, was on discrete and process manufacturing. So again, the trend suggests that um, there's already a lot of investment being done there uh, in that area. And as you can see, more data suggests that almost 80% of the companies will implement IoT projects in 2022 and 95% by 2027. So there will be an extent of usage of IIoT in industrial operation, particularly as we are discussing here in the manufacturing field. Now, the idea is because IIoT will be increasing in future, there, this is not really a technology. So what I mean by that is over time, IIoT will also evolve as well. And uh, the technology that you are using for I, uh, IoT or IIoT in this case, there will be additions to that. New technologies will come and take over the industry, and that will become the new industry standard over time. And while we're talking about the new technology that might come with IoT, I think that would be the perfect time to discuss about Industry 5.0. At this point, I would like to welcome uh, Indu to, or rather welcome back Indu to discuss how Industry 5.0 is envisioned to be. Thank you. Thank you, AK. Industry 5.0. As most of you would know, there's no standard definition of the term Industry 5.0. Although this is going to be how I like, so how I, I would imagine would be, you know, people working alongside what they call as collaborative robots and smart machines, and we would be leveraging the best of both worlds. So it was going to be about people and society and putting, again, people and society back at the center and reimagining what our industry and society should look like. So some imagine this as a society 5.0, if you like. And actually, if you search up society 5.0 and man's vision on this, there's lots of um, very interesting information and interesting take that Japan is actually taking on its society 5.0. I could say industry 5.0 is almost adding a personal human touch back to industry 5.0 and to the pillars of automation and efficiency. So looking at the trend from where we've come from and where we are going, in Industry 5.0, we are again compelled to design our environment, thinking more about a human-centered approach rather than technology-centered approach. And I'm pretty sure there's going to be a greater focus on you know, social, environmental, and ethical considerations as well. And there's also going to be a greater focus on issues that created in the past multiple decades, such as waste management, how do we think about circular economy, and how do we think about sustainability in a more holistic way, again, from their players' 
to the smaller players down. A quick comparison between industry 4.0 versus 5.0 here. I'm not going to go through all the um, table, but I will just talk through it as I've done. So industry 4.0 focused on the interconnectedness of machines and systems. And this is again in order to achieve better efficiency and better productivity. Industry 5.0 is again may, you know, made to be taking a step further and we are going to refine the interaction that we have between humans, environment and the machines. So in manufacturing environment, for example, you've got your robots who have historically basically performed things like dangerous tasks, monotonous tasks, or physically demanding tasks, such as, you know, it could be welding or those painting in car factor, uh, factories and so on. But as machines get um, smarter as well and more connected, in Industry 5.4, we are thinking or we are expecting that there's going to be a merge between the cognitive computing capabilities that machines are again we are training the machines to have much more cognitive computing abilities and that is going to merge with the human intelligence and give us a more resourceful collaborative operation now there are two ways to think about industry 5.4 or there are two visions so to speak so some would say it's a increased collaboration again between humans and smart systems uh, particularly like in the manufacturing industry and they are, we are going to think about more uh, more about you know how we are going to have hyper customization yeah so human robot working is one of the visions and the other vision is that there is going to be more of the focus on the bioeconomy and the sustainability of things now if you're thinking about um, industry 5.0 you can think about it as a more faster more scalable and more people centered than the previous kind of revolutions which have been more about just the mass production and manufacturing in this case however in any of the visions that people are imagining 5.0 we are imagining it in more serious considerations to the society the environment economy ethics all of that that makes us a society basically it's going to lift our way of living, my opinion so thinking about the transition from 4.0 to 5.0 i think when we talk about all the influences that we've got that we need to think about you know the society the environment the ethics and all of that these are all going to be underpinned by again like i mentioned before the waste prevention perspective as well now when i think about or talk about waste prevention it's not just the physical waste that we create you know it's not just the general waste or the general waste that comes from production line and logistics it also talks about the urban waste you know the in empty spaces the inadequate infrastructure process waste that we can talk about in terms of overproducing or things about overstocking and also the social waste in terms of you know people who are willing to work but there is no opportunity for them to actually perform work. So I think industry 5.4, we should be imagining it with a full product life cycle in mind. We should think about the circular economy in mind, and we should think about the key components of what we call as ESG, the environment, the sustainability, and the governance or the ethics in mind as well. Uh, I'll pass over to Dr. Ake's point. Thanks, Indu. Yeah, so as Indu mentioned, so Industry 4.0, uh, rather Industry 5.0 will be slightly different from Industry 4.0 because the visions are slightly different and there are different ways of interpreting uh, interpreting that. So when whereas Industry 4.0 is all about machines as they, uh, are basically being connected together and operate, uh, humans operating from a safer distance and remotely monitoring them, Industry 5.0 is more about bringing humans back to the operation flow. So, but again, in a safe manner. So this is more from the manufacturing perspective that I'm saying this. So, whereas in Industry 4.0, as you can see here, manpower was distanced from a factory. Industry 5.0 will be about humans back as humans being the center of the whole operation. And this will actually result in, as you can see, focus on connecting machines uh, in Industry 4.0. Whereas Industry 5.0 will be having a better customer experience because they will be having a better communication at a deeper level. So the main difference, if you have a look here, in Industry 5.0, the customer aspirations will drive the market interest towards a hyper-customization compared to the mass customization that is for 
or that is now current state of art for industry 4.0 because in industry 5.0 what will happen is manufacturers will have a, a large robotized intelligent factories right that are positioned around the globe to manufacture the basic design of the product and then the basic semi-finished materials will be sent to for example the local factories where you'll have the customization done to manual labor by humans so again we're still having a part that is fully uh, like robotized but you're also having the human aspect to it and at the same time you're allowing humans and robots to work together towards a more customizable yeah customizable product and that will also impact the supply chain as well instead of being intelligent supply chain and response yeah rather you will now have a responsive and distributed supply chain and uh, instead of smart products you will have experience activated products what that basically means is Industry 5.0 will enable the day-to-day -day products to comprehend and respond to the end user's requirement through edge intelligence. So again, that's edge technology is something uh, like more advanced to uh, cloud technology. With Industry 4.0, product, products were enabled to collect the usage data, uh, let's say track usage patterns and transmit, uh, rather transmit it to the supervisor but they had limited actionable intelligence built into them but supported by fast connectivity industry 5.0 products can actually optimize their performance and deliver maximum efficiency throughout the lifetime of that product that's something i think you mentioned beforehand as well so that's something an optimal service that you are getting throughout the lifetime of a product is basically because of the way industry 5.0 is set up. Another thing, besides the you know, better utilization of waste, uh, as I you know, previously mentioned by Indu, so the other aspect of industry 4.0 that's actually beneficial or important for you or all the audience to understand is, while the uh, explosion of data will create new employment opportunities associated with data monitoring and control in industry 4.0 the job roles on the shop floor will evolve in industry 5.0 and you need to integrate multiple set of skills into one so for example roles such as machine maintenance or quality assurance will actually merge into the roles of plant operations and they will become one job and that will basically require employees like you and me and everyone in the industry to be trained in multiple and diverse job roles. And that's why you will probably need to upskill with the features of industry uh, 5.0, or in this case, industry 4.0 for now, but in the future also for industry 5.0 to be ready or the industry ready. So, Based, based on that, here are the key enablers for Industry 5.0. So as we're going to be discussing now is what are the components we feel would help us improve upon Industry 4.0 into Industry 5.0, right? So have a quick look at how a basic operation floor in Industry 5.0 might look like. The key thing, as I mentioned before, is the robots and humans working together. So you will have collaborative robots or cobots as they're known, working with humans, and they're operating together in a safe manner. You have technologies such as augmented reality, which we'll be discussing in a minute, uh, all these different components that basically helps you with the planning stage of a product. You also have components such as um, blockchain helps with better you know, tracking of data as well as communication aspects. You will probably have uh, unmanned trucks and vehicles that helps with distribution. You will have uh, computer vision helps with data analytics and big data. You'll also have a key technology of wearables. Now, this is something I mentioned beforehand as well, that uh, we are already using a certain amount of wearables, but in future, you will actually have the con uh, more advanced wearables such as exoskeletons. So that will also something, uh, that is also something we'll be discussing a bit later on. But overall, as you can have a look, as you have a look at the industry 5.0 operation, 
The key feature is all those different operations still happening, but with a human as a key person being involved in it as uh, compared to industry 4.0. So what are the pillars of Industry 5.0? As you can see, these are some of the technologies we suggest or we feel would be with the transition to Industry 5.0. Now, some of these are already in the process of being introduced, but as I mentioned, with Industry 5.0, the operation and the outcome itself will be slightly different, and that will basically be the difference uh, or a different uh, that will basically set the diff uh, difference between industry 4.0 and 5.0 so here are the key technologies as you can see industrial blockchain drones exoskeletons additive technology like 3d printing but in a more advanced manner 5g and uh, beyond and mixed reality now let's uh, have a quick discussion about each of those technologies and how that might actually help so the first one is collaborative automation so the main thing and as i mentioned will be the interaction between robots and humans in a uh, collaborative manner so by putting humans back into the loop industry 5.0 profoundly restructures the human task in the realm of manufacturing uh, and that basically benefits the workers they're more upskilled than from manual to towards the more cognitive labor and they are able to provide value at tasks in production and to work slightly different from how it used to be like where it's, uh, it was actually the computers and uh, robots that were helping the humans in this case you can actually see the humans actually helping out with the value added task to robots uh, but with peace of mind alongside the autonomous workforce in a collaborative manner and that actually helping out with the manufacturing process. Another one is mixed reality. So augmented or virtual reality will also play a very important role, but more in the earlier stages of the of your, like production, where you have like optimization and enhanced productivity that can be provided through this, so like quality, speed, flexibility, um, a very simple use case might be, you know, uh, machining and production or factory planning, assembly line design, uh, testing operations or digital prototyping. So a quick, uh, simple example here, as you can see, you have a simple component there, but with augmented reality, you can actually have a virtualized version where you can actually make tweaks here and see how that might look. So again, helping with the planning stage. So these will again, because humans will be involved in the operation flow, these operations can be done there on the operation flow in a safe manner. We also have uh, the additive technology. So integrating automation with additive technology or the 3D printing. So 3D printing is already available and already being used. But what's good about 3D printing is how it will be able to complement Industry 5.0. So you can see just an estimation of the next five to 10 years, what type of uh, components can be used in 3D printing, whether it's a supply chain or whether it's IP, prote uh, IP protection, or you have macro 3D printing, or you have nanoscale 3D printing, that might be a study uh, in the future, but consumer 3D printing. So with the 3D printing, you are actually, the main benefit to Industry 5.0 is it's actually able to complement industry 5.0 so whether it's prototyping or product development volume manufacturing production grade mechanical uh, mechanical parts manufacturing all these can be possible with uh, uh, 3d printing or additive technologies like 3d printing that will be one of the key components of industry 5.0 then you have industrial drones uh, sorry we don't have too much time so you probably have to hurry up there but with industrial drones also as you can see uh, a very simple example would be a mining sector where you actually can send industrial drones to check them or monitor or, the, or rather monitor the conditions in a safe manner. So inventory management, stock location, product scanning, those can also be done as well. Exoskeletons, I feel, will be one of the key factors as well. Uh, so with the exoskeleton, one of the things that will be there is actually uh, it will actually 
the humans can help issue. Wearable technology like exoskeletons help support workers with reduce muscle effort, improve quality of work, and help with the ergonomics basically. So allows for a more comfort comfortable interaction, but it avoids undesirable and the risky overloads. Blockchain. So again, a very hot topic nowadays, blockchain ultimately, which is basically a digital record of transactions. So in the manufacturing, or rather industry 5.0 manufacturing, the blockchain will actually help with like um, fine screening and onboarding, you have record keeping, data's privacy and security, that will be a very key part of industry 5.0 as well. So with blockchain, and also trade processing. So all these uh, different aspects will actually be aided by the uh, use of blockchain and the increasing use of blockchain that will be coming in the future. Blockchain itself is a long topic. We don't really have time to discuss about that. But now we just try, uh, just trying to show how blockchain will also be a key part of the digital supply chain in Industry 5.0. And then you finally you have the 5G technology. So the fifth uh, generation, um, uh, rather technology standard for broadband cellular networks. So in future, of course, there will probably be more upgrades to that. But the main benefit with the 5G technology is because all the machines, all the industry 4.0 are beyond that will be about machines communicating with each other or a lot of data being trans yeah, yeah, transferred. So with 5G or beyond, you know, one of the key benefits will be latency. So you will be able to have a much reliable and faster communication. Also, again, that component that I mentioned, security, it's a very fundamental topic. So it's actually part of all the other topics. So the yeah, security is not really mentioned individually, but all the different aspects will actually have a focus on security. And again, just like that, 5G will also be uh, one of those technologies that will enable the machines to communicate much faster with each other. So these are basically the key enablers that we feel will be the key aspects of as we move towards industry 5.0. So in, at this point, I would just like to introduce, uh, welcome back Indu to provide us a quick summary of what we covered in this presentation today. Thank you. Thank you, AK. Um, it was a fascinating to see all the different technologies that are going to, you know, we're going to see some growth in in the future. Now, there was a lot of quite interesting questions and conversation that was going on in the chat while we are um, we were going through the presentation. What I would like to say or end this would be, you know, in the end of the day, it's only natural for us, you know, to expect an, you know evolution in the way we live and work because you know we are seeing a huge technological innovation evolve and it's ha happening more and more rapidly. If you think about the evolution hyper um, curve, you know, we go through a big process of you know increasing very rapidly and then we go through a process of what they call as disillusionment before we pick up our space again the concept of industry 5.0 the main thing should be to ease some of the apprehension we hold where for example you know that cognitive computing you know that advanced robotics or the cyber machinery it's not about eliminating the need for human um, inter uh, you know interaction but it's more about you know getting people back into the equation of you know how we can use our you know higher cognitive power to better use so we could end up restructuring human tasks in you know in for example in manufacturing that benefits the workers so for example um, humans would you know people in the manufacturing law would more likely handle the lighter workloads and more about the thinking side of things while the machines take care of the more uh, strenuous repetitive mundane tasks so to speak so the greatest advantages or the advances that we can predict with the 5.0 is to involve your interaction, human intelligence and the cognitive computing. So basically combining your human and the computerized machinery with using you know, AI algorithms and, and so on to take manufacturing to a new level, to a new levels of speed and perfection. We're going to think about more about even though we are doing mass production, we are going to be customizing things and this evolution could also prove more advantages in because 
more and more um, companies are thinking about the environment, uh, more boards are thinking about, you know, how do we think about sustainability and how we think about, for example, using renewable energy, how do we eliminate waste? So we are moving more towards the human machine symbiosis in the industry 5.0. And I believe that we are taking a step in the right direction where we are moving towards a more meaningful interaction, a more meaningful relationship between man, machine and the environment. Thank you very much. Um, any questions? Thanks, Indu and AK. I've been monitoring the chat box and Indu, I think you've responded to, to the majority of questions that were, were coming through. Um, I'm just going to go to the next slide if that's okay, because um, there was quite a few questions in the chat box. If any of you would like to receive a certificate um, of participation um, from attending this webinar today, please email us with your full name. Um, to the email address up on the screen and we will organise a personalised certificate to send out um, and we will also be sending out the recording to everyone who has been online today and who has registered. Massive thank you to you AK and Indu for presenting and providing your insight today. Um, obviously AK it's very late your, your side of Australia and Indu probably looking forward to getting home. Um, but a massive thank you for everyone to, that came online today um, and we hope that you found it informative. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Uh, appreciate some feedback uh, later on as uh, during this. Thank you so much.